Well, thanks, Ben, for that last session. And so for our last person to talk to you today, I'm really happy to introduce to you Usman Khaled, who's the Director of Workflows and Events here at AWS. Usman, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So events and workflows, uh, what does that mean in terms of the serverless story? So if you think of uh, serverless architecture and you look at Fargate or Lambda, those are your boxes in your architecture. The services that I manage, which are event bridge, step functions, they are the lines in your architecture. They are the things that connect uh, these, these boxes together. So effectively, you use EventBridge as a form of choreogra choreographing, uh, choreo choreographing a large number of Lambda functions or your reactive applications together. And in set functions, you're really taking the, the challenges of distributed computing and then putting them all in, in, in step functions and having that solve them for you. And you're orchestrating a large number of uh, Lambda functions or a large number of microservices together. So that's mm. the, how the lines actually help with the boxes. So what would you say is the value of a service like step functions in terms of what it replaces if you didn't use it? Well, that's a great question. So, and, and I'll actually start by how actually Amazon itself uses step functions a lot. So there is no software develop deployment or hardware uh, deployment in, in, within AWS services or Amazon that does not use step functions or workflows in some form or form. Because we've, what we realized in the years of building uh, service-oriented architecture is that distributed systems are hard. And workflows through, the, through features like having uh, only once executions or having retries or taking asynchronous systems and building them, putting them reliably together and helping you operate them reliably together really, really help. Step functions take you to the next level because you're not writing code. Mm -hmm. So if you try to do this yourself, you're going to be writing a lot of glue code and you're still going to have a hard time as a developer to get that reliability in your uh, in your, between your microservices. And that's what you, what you get from step functions out of the box where you get a visual workflow system and it just, takes care of all those those really gnarly uh, distributed system challenges automatically for you. Yeah, so I've got to ask you then, since you're the GM of, of the service, you know, what do you say to people who say that step functions is expensive? That's a great question. So we already talked about the value mm. of step functions and what, what they really add. So within step functions, we, uh, we have two forms of workflows. And really, you use them as, as part of your architectural design. And, and, and I would always say this, when it comes to architecture, there's no such thing as the right architecture. There's only the right trade-offs that you're going to be making. So with, with step functions, we have two types of workflows. The first one is called the standard step functions workflow. These are incredibly long running. They can go up to a year. And when you have tasks which are, uh, which are heavily asynchronous or long running and you want to be wait, you're waiting for things, these workflows are the most cost effective way of actually building this application on AWS. Then you have a second flavor of workflows, which are called express workflows. These are basically priced similar to Lambda, where they can scale incredibly quickly, um, and they are and you're you're using them for mostly for event-driven uh, workloads or event-driven processing, where you have very small chunks of data that you're act, acting on really quickly. And these things basically scale like at, at, the, at the same cost and and, and performance of, of Lambda. So we have two flavors within Step Functions. You, and we give customers the tools to use whichever one fits their needs the best. Yeah, and you mentioned a little bit in your answer, but you know, as developers here, we know that one size fits all doesn't generally really apply to any real life situation. And you've got event driven architectures and serverless coming together. How do you think about how to choose between them or, or, or plug them together when you're building something? I don't think it's actually a choice, bet choice between them. Mm. Uh, event driven architectures, when you start thinking about them, I, th I think the right way of thinking about them first is at the organizational level. What, what event driven architectures that you do as a customer or as an organization is really decouple your teams, uh, decouple, decouple your systems and the way they are developed. And that's what, what a lot of our customers are realizing now when they actually build EDAs, is that they are seeing incredible amounts of innovation come from their teams because now you're no longer negotiating changes in the system. The system is a very evolutionary system. Serverless technologies, especially Lambda, from the ground up are the best ways of building EDAs because they scale and they handle bursty workloads so, so well. Um, and they're from the ground up designed to be well integrated with services like Step Functions and the Bridge. And so it's it's not a it's really peanut butter and jelly mm. versus like a or uh, argument here. So that's what we're really seeing from customers today with EDAs. Mm. Now many people probably don't know this, but you've built this absolutely massive scale infrastructure, really from nothing over the years. And I think very few people have had this sort of experience you have. So for customers and developers who are building very large systems, what sort of lessons have you learned that they could learn from? 
I think the biggest lesson I would share organizationally when we, when we brought the org together in 2019 and started building these things is to actually go serverless first. Uh, we never intend to be the biggest part of customers' bills. As, as I said, we are the lines between the boxes. So we are not a huge organization in terms of engineers. Mm -hmm. And so we really knew that this is an area where we needed to innovate and move really quickly. And so that's a challenge many of our customers have as well in their particular verticals or, or business that they're in. And so what we decided to do was be serverless first, bet on AWS, build on AWS. And so when I look at it the last three years, for example, we've launched about 45 features, including six new services. Uh, from a, from a group of from the same engineering group basically, and that's incredible. And part of it is that we've basically because we use serverless technologies, we've offloaded a lot of the our, our architectural and complexity as well as a lot of operational complexity around mm -hmm. patching, around scaling. Uh, all of that is basically handled through by by the use of serverless technologies ourselves, which allows then our, uh, allows us to move super super quickly. So effectively, we are the poster child of uh, our own technologies at mm -hmm. the end. So out of all the features you launched in the last couple of years, and I know as the GM, all of them are specialty, but what are, what are a couple of your favorite features that you've seen? Well, I think the, the couple of the ones that we launched recently really come to mind for me. Uh, EventBridge Pipes, mm -hmm. where we really now brought the experience of, of routing and simply sending events between different, or integrating different AWS services together. The same experience you have with the event bus now is available with any of our transport layers. So you have a, a, a singular developer experience whether you use SQS, Kafka, and uh, Amazon MQ and Kinesis streams or DynamoDB streams. So that's a pretty exciting thing for me as a, because we're always looking as a set of uh, technologies to get developers to write less boilerplate code, really focus on the real value that they can add mm -hmm. to their business. So now they can remove the boilerplate code from all this, when, when they're integrating with these other technologies as well. So pretty excited about that. And the second one I would say, which is also very recent, I'm really excited about is distributed map and mm -hmm. step functions, where now you're able to orchestrate tens of thousands of Lambda functions in a single workflow. Uh, we've already seen some incredible stories from customers like CyberGRX, where they have cut down their processing time from days to minutes by going serverless and, and using this parallel processing. So uh, one of the things I've been noodling over is that we should try building a, a supercomputer and see if we can tear, <laughs> build a supercomputer and tear it down in a second. Because that would be something truly unique as, as a species. So I'm pretty excited about that. One day we should try that out. Great. Now when you're building these things, of course, you don't have to use the console. We show the console a lot in our demos to give it a flavor, but actually people are using lots of tools under the cover. What are the sort of tools that you think um, developers should start to use and learn to really start to, to build things effectively? So obviously CloudFormation is our standard IAC mm -hmm. tool, but on top of that we have serverless uh, application model SAM, and then we have the CDK uh, constructs as well. And they're both incredibly popular for when it comes to serverless developers, especially SAM and CDK. And I'll, I'll focus on CDK first, where you, you, as you build your serverless application, you're actually enca enca encapsulating your business logic in many cases. In the case of EventBridge or Step Functions, where many of your, most of your integration is configuration. It's not even code. So you don't have any liability around, around carrying boilerplate code. You can actually express that in your IAC as well, which is CDK, and CDK is super popular. Right. What's your favorite? Do you prefer SAM or CDK? Which camp are you in? Oh, you put me on the spot here. Uh, I would say CDK. As a, as a long-term term developer, I find just expressing my, my, my needs as code in my favorite language, and CDK is supported by all the CD, uh, SDK languages that we have. Mm -hmm. So no C++. <laughs> uh, I don't do it in C++, but certainly TypeScript is a really popular one for me, where our favorite one of mine, where I can just use some types script to actually connect my and wire up my applications together. So mm. I'd, say, I'd go with CDK, but SAM's a close second, especially when it comes to declarative ways of describing mm. our architecture. I, don't, I think SAM is such a simple way of doing that on top of CloudFormation. Yeah. Now, if, if, again, if you're getting started in this space as a developer, what are some of the resources that you can use to learn some of these tools and these services that we've been talking about throughout today? Great. And I'd say we have two forms of learning resources. The first one is basically self-learning. And we have serverlessland.com, which has amazing patterns, mm. both simple ones and more advanced ones to get, you, get the imagination going, if nothing else, on our, what you can build on serverless. And we have our digital learning courses where you can get the serverless badge as well. The second resource is our in-person resources. We have innovation days, we have summits, and then we have our partners and solution architects who can also help you get going uh, and follow best, best practices with serverless as well as 
be well architected on serverless. So I, I would say those are our two primary resources to get going. Okay. And then this morning when we, when we spoke to Ajay, I, I asked him the same question. I want to ask you the same question. You know, you've been here a really very long time and seen the growth of all of these services really from, from hardly anything to this massive scale used by millions of customers you know, across the world. Where do you see it going in the next few years? I think our mission is still going to be around democratizing the uh, serverless technologies and making them really, really simple. Because at the end of the day, you're still building distributed systems. And, and we're really, really asymptotically working towards making it so that it almost feels like you're programming on a single process on a mm. single host. So challenges like batching or item potency or challenges like uh, sequencing of how do, you, how, how do you handle events in sequence, these are some of the things I think we will be able to handled within the serverless technologies ourselves, so developers more and more feel at home when they even get started, mm. get becoming experts. So I, I think that's going to be a big part. Another big part with asynchronous systems is around observability. Yes, you've decoupled your teams. Yes, you've decoupled your, your architecture, but now it becomes a challenge sometimes to actually dis discover where something is breaking. And I think really, really state-of-the-art observability is going to be the next thing that we are focusing on mm. and we're going to be driving. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really thank a pleasure to have you here telling everybody about your insights into these services. And that really wraps what we've had today. So I'd like to thank absolutely everybody for these seven hours plus of different presentations and demos we've had throughout the day. 